Welcome to St. Margaret. We especially greet all visitors and guests who are with us to share in today's liturgy. We ask that you please silence all cell phones and electronic devices. The readings for today's Mass can be found on page 1169 of the Gather Hymnal. That's page number 1169. The second collection this weekend is for St. Margaret's Religious Education Programs. This evening's Mass is being offered for William R. Penn II, Sarah Bankston, Linda Mano Bauer, Philip Brabham, Cheryl Brothers, Karen Chimay, Philip Clifton, Leanne Collette, Leon Dotrieve Jr., Daniel John Dietrich, Anna and Paula DiStefano, Peter Larry Foss Jr., Homer Gaspar, Ricky Jenry, Francis Cronlidge, Vernon and Dorothy Landry, Valentine Langlois, Irene Mary Leon, Ray J. Louvier, Kelsey Martin, Adam Moxery, Eric Navarre, Dustin Novak, Henry Novak, Sue Novak, Dr. William T. O'Brien III, June Coles Ola, Lynette Piffner, Peter J. and Elizabeth Piffner, Emily Quintana, Bill Rogers Jr., Anne Sherman, and David and Lori Landry Smith. We so often find ourselves confronted with conflicting values and demands. Today we ponder how to balance our call to discipleship with our culture's call to accumulate wealth and material things. We hear that God is aware of both greed and the needs of the poor. Please stand and join us in singing our opening hymn, number 524, Alleluia number 1, number 524. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. And dear brothers and sisters, we gather uh, this evening as we celebrate the 26th Sunday of Ordinary Time. And as we do so, let us together acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate in these sacred mysteries. Send to me heal thy contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy, Kidian is on. Lord, have mercy, Kidian is on. You came to the cross, sinners. Christ, have mercy. Christ Christ have mercy, 
Seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy, Kyrie eleison. Lord, have mercy, Kyrie Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of good will. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of good will. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son. Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us, you take away the sins of the world. Receive our prayer, you are seated at the right hand of the Father. Have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of good will. Let us pray. O God, who manifests your almighty power above all by pardoning and showing mercy, bestow, we pray, your grace abundantly upon us, and make those hastening to attain your promises heirs to the treasures of heaven. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Amos. Thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, woe to the complacent Zion. Lying upon beds of ivory, stretched comfortably on their couches, they eat lambs taken from the flock and calves from the stall. Improvising to the music of the harp, like David, they devise their own accompaniment. They drink wine from bowls and anoint themselves with the best oils. Yet they are not made ill by the collapse of Joseph. Therefore, now they shall be the first to go into exile, and their wanton revelry shall be done away with. The word of the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. 
fidelity forever, who does justice to those who are oppressed. It is he who gives bread to the hungry, the Lord who sets free sinners free. Praise the Lord, my soul, praise the Lord. the eyes of the blind, the Lord who raises up those who are by down. It is the Lord who loves thy just, the Lord who protects the stranger. Praise the Lord, my soul, praise the Lord. The orphan and the widow, but thwarts the path of the wicked. The Lord will reign forever, the God of Zion from age to age. Praise the Lord, my soul. Praise the Lord. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to Timothy. But you, man of God, pursue righteousness, devotion, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Compete well for the faith. Lay hold of eternal life to which you were called when you made the noble confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you before God, who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, who gave testimony under Pontius Pilate for the noble confession, to keep the, to, to keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ, that the blessed and only ruler will make manifest at the proper time, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, and whom no human being has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal power, Amen. The word of the Lord. Be with you. 
A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus said to the Pharisees, There was a rich man who dressed in purple garments and fine linen and dined sumptuously each day. And lying at his door was a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who would gladly have eaten his fill of the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. Dogs even used to come and lick his sores. When the poor man died, he was carried away by angels to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried, and from the netherworld, where he was in torment, he raised his eyes and saw Abraham far off, and Lazarus at his side. And he cried out, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am suffering torment in these flames. Abraham replied, My child, remember that you received what was good during your lifetime, while Lazarus likewise received what was bad. But now he is comforted here, whereas you are tormented. Moreover, between us and you, a great chasm is established to prevent anyone from crossing who might wish to go from our side to yours or from your side to ours. He said, Then I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they too come to this place of torment. But Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. He said, O no, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Then Abraham said, If they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone should rise from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. About two years ago, at the seminary, some of my classmates had the idea to start up a, a poetry reading group. You might call it a poetry club. And now I know that sounds like just about the nerdiest thing that a person can do, and it is, but hear me out for a second. We were inspired by one of our professors who was teaching us about biblical poetry. Yes, surprisingly enough, there's actually quite a bit of the Old Testament that is poetic in nature. It's a little bit difficult to recognize in the English translation, but we were thinking to ourselves, how much, how much better readers of Scripture could we be if we learned, how much better readers of biblical poetry could we be if we learned how to appreciate poetry in general, just to learn how to read it? And so we would, we would get together from time to time, you know, every couple of weeks, and we would pick, you know, some of the, some of the more classic, some of the more uh, renowned poems that have been written, and we would kind of read them together, we would discuss them after to try and figure out what, what insights we could gain. And it wasn't long, we went along like this for a little while, and it wasn't long before we got it into our minds to tackle the mother of all Christian poetry, Dante's Divine Comedy. Now, if you don't know, Dante was a poet who lived around the 13th century, and his Divine Comedy is his masterpiece, his greatest work. It's a a book-length epic poem. And uh, I won't bore you with all, all the details of the plot, but essentially... Dante, the poet, he puts himself into his own poetry as the main character, and he describes being taken on a mystical vision 
It's this long vision throughout the whole course of the poem where he's taken on a journey through hell, purgatory, and heaven. And he is allowed to see the fate of the just and the unjust. Because you see, Dante describes this experience of wanting to live a just life, wanting to follow the Lord's command, but not being strong enough, not being able to overcome his own sin. And so he is allowed this vision of what happens to us after we pass from this life. He has allowed this vision for a medicinal purpose, so that knowing the truth about the four last things heaven, hell, death, and judgment, so that knowing the truth, he might be strengthened, might be given a a booster shot, if you will, to fight against sin, to fight against his own shortcomings. He sees that, he sees the fate of those who have turned their backs on God, and that, you know, no matter what their no matter what their sin was in life, no matter what it was, how it was that they turned their backs on God, he sees the fate, not only the punishment that they are allowed to suffer, but also he even is allowed to speak with some of them and to hear their voices and to hear their story. But of course, the beauty of the Divine Comedy is that it doesn't end there. It doesn't end, you know, in hell, just showing us all the things that we have to be afraid of. He's taken on a journey as well to see purgatory, to see the fate of those who died in a state of grace but still needed to be purified, still needed to let go of their attachments to sin. And finally, he's able to, he's given the privilege of a glimpse in this vision of of the heavenly realms, of the fate of the just. And I think that this whole, the whole project that, that the poet was engaged in was getting at our need as human beings in this life to have some knowledge, some knowledge about the fate of our souls, about those four last things, you remember death, judgment, heaven, and hell, in order that we might be strengthened to live rightly. And of course I say all this because I think that this is very similar to what we see happening in the gospel today. We hear We hear the pleading of the rich man. We see his torment. And as much as we might feel tempted to be sorry for him, we're told in no uncertain terms by the gospel that he is exactly where he deserves to be, exactly where he has merited to be with his life. And the reality is that the rich man is not, he's not in punishment because of his great riches really, because of the wealth that he owned, as much as it may sound that way in the narrative, he's not there because of his great riches. The reason he is there is because of the hardness of his heart. That the rich man, his refusal to show mercy to Lazarus sitting on his doorstep, to the poor man in need of his help, led in turn to his refusal to ask mercy for himself. Because no matter how great his sin had been, if he had asked for mercy, like the prodigal son, he would not have been refused. Because we know that God does not wish the death of the sinner, but rather that he be converted and live. But our, our attention might be drawn to this chasm that we hear about. We hear that this chasm has been established between the place where Lazarus went and the place where the rich man goes. And, of course, the language might make us ask, well, if if the chasm has been established, then then who established it? Who put it there? And, you know, we we don't like to hear, we don't really like to hear about barriers. We don't like to hear about boundaries that cannot be crossed. Aren't we supposed to be aren't we supposed to be bringing people together as Christians rather than driving them apart? And the answer is yes. However, in this narrative, in this gospel story, we have come across the one gap in the entire cosmos that cannot be bridged. And that is the gap between holiness and sin. You see, the 
the key to understanding the gospel, the key to understanding what Jesus came to show us is to realize Jesus drew near to sinners. He always embraced sinners. But he never drew near to sin. And he never embraced sin. And our ability to make this distinction is going to have a radical effect on how well we are able to interpret Jesus' message, whether, he, whether we can understand what he really came to teach us. Because a lack of repentance in our own hearts is basically we are clinging to our sin. You know, we're clinging to it like the mast of a ship or like a big rock. And the nature of sin is to flee from God, is to be far from God because it's antithetical to who he is. It's the exact opposite of God's nature. So when we refuse to repent of our sin, like the rich man did, we're basically, we're not allowing Jesus to separate us from our sin. Jesus wants us to draw close to him, but the sin cannot approach him. That's why we have the doctrine of purgatory, that in order to be blessed forever in heaven, we need to be purified of that sin. And our ability to repent, our ability to ask forgiveness of our sins, depends on whether we can acknowledge that as deeply rooted as my sin might be in my own heart, it is not a part of who I am. It is not part of what makes me, me. It is not part of who God created me to be. So being able to make that distinction between myself and the sins that I commit out of my own failures allows Jesus into that space where he's able to forgive us and to heal us. Now one last point. God does not prefer to use fear to draw us to him. It is not his preferred way of speaking to us. Because we, and I tell people all the time that fear is not of the Lord, that it's not the way that he speaks to us, and I stand by that because God is perfect love, and perfect love casts out fear. But what God will do when necessary out of his love for us is he will simply show us the truth. He will show us the true nature of how things are, of where we are going, where we have been, what we are created for, and whether and to what extent we fall short of that. He simply simply shows us the truth. And if we react in fear to that, if that revelation of how things really are causes in us a reaction of fear, it's meant to be a signal to us that there is something in my, in my life that requires my attention, something that I need to know about and attend to, and if necessary, to change something about the way that I'm living. But that, that permissive will of God in allowing us to experience that fear Even the fear of eternal damnation is always, always directed towards, it's intended to help us learn to love rightly, learn to love correctly. Because, as I said, perfect love casts out fear. Fear and love are exactly opposed to each other. They're incompatible. The extent to which we love is the extent to which we no longer need to fear. Because I know, I know I've had many experiences in my life where if I'm, if I'm struggling against some fear, whether it's a fear of you know, some, some bodily suffering or pain that I would like to avoid or, or fear of saying something stupid in front of the church or whatever, <laughs> what helps me to break out of that, to overcome that fear, is to envision in my mind or to direct my attention toward a person or a group of people that I love. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest this to you, and I'll let you try it out on your own, and you can tell me whether you think I'm right. 
Whenever you have an experience of that fear, it might have been fear in response to what we just heard in the gospel today. But it might also be, you know, fear of doing poorly at work or fear of disappointing a friend or a relative, whatever it is. When you experience that fear, look for something to love. Not just, not just any kind of love. Look for something or someone, persons are better, to love selflessly, to love with abandon. Because fe- every fear that we experience is an invitation. It's an opportunity from the Lord to learn to love better, to grow in love, and to reach out for the heavenly reward in the heavenly kingdom. Perfect love, cast out all fear. Let us turn to the Lord now and profess our faith together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified in the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will back to the I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and his Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. My brothers and sisters, let us now pray for all who are in need as we bring our petitions before the Father who loves us so much he sent, he sent to us our, our Savior. That we, the Holy Church of God, will heed the call to work for justice and show mercy to the poor and vulnerable, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who guide the nations of this world will order themselves and those they lead toward the service of others, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That our country, state, and community may be places where all God's children feel loved, treasured and safe, regardless of age, race, or social standing, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who suffer from illness, poverty, or abandonment in our midst may feel the love of Jesus, who gives life to all things, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who hear the call to serve the church as priests, deacons, religious, or lay ministers, may pursue righteousness, devotion, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That our parish community may compete well for the faith by our commitment to serve those less fortunate than ourselves. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That all who have died may be carried by angels to the eternal banquet. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray in silence for our intentions and for the intentions of others to our God who raises up those who are bowed down.
Almighty God and Father, in your goodness, hear our prayers for those in need. Grant us the wisdom to follow your example of mercy, so that we may dwell with you forever. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please join us in singing our offertory hymn, number 735, Blessed Are They, number 735. brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and good of all his holy church. Grant us, O merciful God, that this, our offering, may find acceptance with you, and that through it the wellspring of all blessing may be laid open before us. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For by his birth he brought renewal to humanity's fallen state. By his suffering canceled out our sins. By his rising from the dead, he has opened the way to eternal life. And by ascending to you, O Father, he has unlocked the gates of heaven. And so with the company of angels and saints, we sing the hymn of your praise. As without end, we acclaim.
To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Michael, our Bishop, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants for whom we now pray. And all gathered here, whose faith and devotion are known to you, for them we offer you this sacrifice of praise. Are they offered for themselves and all who are dear to them for the redemption of their souls and hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true? In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, and all your saints, we ask that through their merits and prayers in all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become for us the body and the blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands and with eyes raised to heaven to you, O God, his almighty Father. Giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. A history of faith. Save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed Passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, 
the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer we ask you, Almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high, in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, who, those sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share in fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon, through Christ our Lord, through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. And at our Savior's command, informed by his divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil, Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Peace. 
behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world, blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Please join in singing our communion hymn, number 930, Taste and See, number 930. Lord. 
worship the Lord, all your people. No one for nothing if you ask. Taste and see that the Lord is good. In God we need put all our trust. Taste and see, taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Oh, taste and see, taste and see the goodness few announcements before our closing collect this evening. <clears throat> our next family faith formation uh, will be tomorrow, uh, September 25th. Is that right? Tomorrow? Yeah. September 25th, tomorrow, uh, Sunday at 11.15. Uh, the topic presented will be uh, by De Deacon Joseph. Uh, it'll be, quote unquote, an instruction for Christian households on Ephesians chapter 5. So we'll be speaking about a very commonly misunderstood um, scripture passage by St. Paul, Ephesians chapter 5. You can go home and read it and then come back and listen about how, what is St. Paul talking about. So Deacon Joseph will give us that tomorrow morning uh, after the 10 a.m. Mass. And that will be uh, in the Hall of Saints. There'll be a March for Life informational meeting uh, plan, plan. There'll be a March for, March for Life information meeting to plan uh, for a 2023 pilgrimage. Um, Thursday, uh, 20, September 29th at 5.30 p.m. Uh, in the Hall of Saints. If you're interested in going on the, mil the March for Life in Washington, D.C., uh, you, you must attend this meeting. Uh, we hope to see you there. That's Thursday, September 29th. This coming Thursday at 5.30. Thomas's Table, uh, their next meeting will be held on that same Thursday, Thursday the 29th of September at 5.30 p.m. in the Hall of Saints. If you're interested in cooking up a storm for all of our ministries, or if you're willing to help us mobilize when we need a response, especially uh, in, the, in, in the time of a natural disaster, that's, this ministry is for you. 
So that will be Thursday, September 29th uh, at 5.30 at the Hall of Saints. And finally, our lector workbooks that aid our lectors in proclaiming God's word uh, here at Mass and the Eucharist are available now uh, right here in the back, uh, right underneath the television back here next to the, uh, the sacristy and the confessional. Uh, you should have a name. The names are printed uh, on the binding of the book. You can pick those up. That's both for St. Uh, Margaret and St. Thomas. Um, all currently scheduled lectures are welcome uh, to pick up a copy of the workbook uh, today. And let us pray. I also wanted to mention, too, as well, some of our faces here uh, today. Our deacon candidates had a workshop all day in the Hall of Saints, and they've joined us, so you could probably notice their faces around here, and their wives as well have joined us here. So continue to pray for all of our, our deacon candidates preparing uh, for that sacrament of holy orders to the diaconate uh, sooner than later for some of them. So. May this heavenly mystery, O Lord, restore us in mind and body, that we may be co-heirs in glory with Christ, to whose suffering we are united whenever we proclaim his death who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your lives. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our closing hymn is number 949, Alleluia, Sing to Jesus. Number 949. Hallelujah, sing to Jesus, He's the scepter, He's the throne. Hallelujah, He's the triumph, He's the victory alone. Heart the songs of peace for Zion, Thunder like a mighty flood, Jesus out of every nation has redeemed us by his blood. Hallelujah, not as orphans are we left in sorrow now. Hallelujah, he is near us. Faith beneath, nor questions how. For the cloud from sight received him when the forty days were on. Shall our hearts forget his promise? I am with you evermore.